Welcome back everybody again uh, tonight is going to be chapter 10 we only have chapter uh, 10 and 11 to do plus then some practice tests in the week uh, week after that so we're approaching the end here hopefully everybody has their exam scheduled so that you can roll right into that as soon as possible so for chapter 10 tonight I'll ask first if there's any any questions or comments kick off not hearing any, we'll jump to the presentation. So I'd like to welcome any online viewers that we, we have as well, and let us know if you're watching. We always appreciate that. 21 on YouTube at the moment. 21 on YouTube. It seems the emails that we get from people who have passed their test and wanted to say thank you are 
the, the majority of them are folks we've never heard of before. So uh, that's uh, just, just a good thing to know that, that people have found the, the channel. So we're uh, going to be covering some very practical things this evening. Radio propagation. So we've talked about uh, electronics and math and circuits and uh, antennas. Antennas was a very practical chapter that Gary covered for us and propagation is, uh, is right up there near the top too in terms of being practical because it's something you'll, you'll all be using. So the first section is electromagnetic waves, section 4.1. There's only one pool question, but there's some uh, background that we need to cover before we get to that one. So when we were talking about uh, potential energy stored in coils and capacitors uh, earlier on, um, potential energy stored in a magnetic or electric field, when it changes, it creates radio waves. So radio waves are a good thing. Without that, we wouldn't have ham radio. And then the radio waves that we create and transmit tickle the electrons in the distant antenna. And if we're fortunate, the result is I can hear you. Dave Kessler had a really excellent uh, animation of uh, electric and magnetic fields in his uh, presentation, his intro. This uh, diagram can be a little confusing. These are actually at right angles to each other. And the basic concept is that uh, in a radio wave, we're always going to have an electric field and a magnetic field, which are always at right angles to each other. In this case, the direction of that wave is coming out this way. So changing electric and magnetic fields are what propagate the energy. And it can, depending upon if your antenna is horizontal or vertical, these two may be reversed. In this case, the electric field is vertical, so this would be like a vertical antenna. And this, this would be how the wave propagates. Now we'll need to talk just briefly about polarization so we can get to our one and only pool question for this section. And as mentioned, it refers to the orientation of the electric field with respect to the Earth. We saw that back here, electric field. And spinning satellites will create circularly polarized waves, which is why circular polarization becomes important. And finally, the one and only pool question in this section, circularly polarized electromagnetic waves are waves with a rotating electric field. And here's an example of a satellite. Uh, and the, the ham sats are pretty interesting because this, this may only be 10 inches, a, a 10 or 12 inch cube. It's really amazing how tiny these things are. But they're typically spinning. And here's a picture of the, uh, the wave front and what the antenna looks like. It's normally two Yagis rotated 90 degrees from one another physically and then fed with a phasing harness that actually causes a 90 degree phase shift in how they're fed. There's an excellent uh, link down here that talks more about circular polarization if anybody wants to know more. And then the one and only pool question. What is meant by circularly polarized electromagnetic waves? A. I think I heard B, Bravo. Bravo. Yep, waves Bravo. with a rotating electric field. All right, so that was our one and only pool question. Now, that, that was pretty easy, right? But we can't be done for tonight. We have a lot more <laughs> stuff. We have a lot more stuff to go through. Solar effects. Uh, this section, 10.2 and then 10.3, are, are really, really interesting. And I've got, <clears throat> I tried to emphasize uh, through this material the practical side think things that you'll really be able to use as you move forward in ham radio. So here's a recommended video which will be for homework. It's only about three and a half minutes long but it does an excellent job of explaining the sunspot cycle, the 11 year uh, sunspot cycle that we all have grown to know and love. 
the site. Uh, NASA also has a bunch of other videos that are very entertaining. Now this looks like a very sciencey, if that's a word, um, a lot of terms here. Here we, we've got the sun and here's a little blow up of some of the, the, the bits and pieces that are all around it. The couple of things that I want to mention though is that the sun is really a continuous reaction, thermonuclear fission, um, which is amazing. And the part of the sun that faces us is commonly referred to as the earth facing disk. The sun is going to be putting out ultraviolet radiation and x-rays, which are forms of light. They come to us at the speed of light, approximately eight minutes from the sun to us. And the other material that's coming off the sun uh, is what's called the solar wind. It's a continuous flow of charged particles from the sun, and um, it directly affects our geomagnetic field around the Earth. More, uh, more on that coming. Now, you've probably used a compass to find your way out of the woods when you're lost. And the reason that a compass works is because of the uh, magnetic field of, of the Earth. And the point, one of the points that's being made here is the uh, magnetic north and the geographic north pole are not exactly the same thing. They're off by a little bit. So as your, uh, some, some uh, orienteering compasses actually have a, a declination adjustment so you, you can move it to cause it to point to true north, which is how, how maps are usually set up. Not really important for our discussion, but what I wanted to show here was there are uh, lines of force coming out from around the Earth that um, are there continuously, and that forms what's called the magnetosphere of, of the Earth. <coughs> and besides the propagation aspects, um, it, it's good for when you get lost, if you have a compass. There is something uh, that will be talking about um, it's possible for the solar wind to be uh, and the solar wind contains uh, magnetic properties and that interacts with the earth especially around the poles there's a solar parameter called b sub z that uh, we'll be getting into all right so if you've ever been in a shopping center they always have these big signs and it says you are here well, in this case, this is the Earth, which is where we are, and we've got the solar wind coming from uh, the sun, and because of the magnetic properties of the Earth, the magnetosphere, you get an effect that's something like this. So we've got the solar wind coming off the, the, the sun, which is particles and all kinds of junk, and the only place that they will normally enter the Earth is through the North and South Pole areas. It's a good thing that we have an ionosphere, or, or a magnetosphere, I should say, because it protects us from a lot of that stuff coming from the Sun. Now there's a lot of solar data, and um, what I'm going to be concentrating on is, well, two things. One is the um, what we need to know to answer the pool questions, of course, that's always an emphasis. And the other is um, I want to share things that are, are going to be of great practical value to you as you continue on in your ham career. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we had some warning of what was coming our way from the sun? We know that we, we can't really predict things like solar flares, which is primarily light, you know, UV and X-rays. Um, because they're coming at the speed of light. But particles, the solar wind, there are actually satellites in space that will give us an advance warning of, of some of the other things that may be coming our way that result from coronal mass injections and other kinds of uh, outputs from the sun. There's a satellite called ACE, A-C-E, and one called GEOS that um, are uh, magnetometer satellites that will be able to detect some of this and give us a little bit of a warning. Typically uh, the solar wind may take, uh, depending upon its nature, could be from a few hours to a few days to get from the sun to the earth. So 
if there's a satellite out there, it, it can uh, detect that and we can get an advance warning. Go ahead. Do you remember back in early 2000s, there were some communication satellites that carried uh, credit card tra uh, data that were knocked out? Um, uh, I don't, but I'm large not. large portion of the U.S. Yeah. couldn't transact. Yep. Yeah, no, they're, um, due to some of the things we'll be talking about, we do have what are called radio blackouts due to extreme um, solar events. And uh, Mark, we'll, we'll be talking about that a bit more. Yeah, there, there's some pretty crazy things that can happen. And I, I mentioned BZ a little earlier. Here we've got the solar wind. There's some other parameters, BY, BX, which we won't be talking about. But BZ uh, has to do with the orientation of the magnetic, magnetic uh, properties of the solar wind interacting with the Earth's magnetosphere. You can see that that is affecting us at the North and South Poles. Now, most of you have probably seen a diagram like this as you've been wandering around different uh, websites. Um, a lot of people will put this display on their website. The author of this uh, makes it freely available for people to include. So at qrz.com and many other places, you'll, you'll see a diagram like this. Uh, a couple of points to make here. This is from April 30th of 2019. That was very near our solar minimum. We haven't really talked about some of these parameters yet, but SFI, which is a solar flux index, was at 67. The sunspot number was zero. And as we'll see in a bit, those are, are terrible, terrible numbers. <laughs> so that this was a very sad time in radio propagation history. And of course, we go through this um, every 11 years, the, uh, the sunspot cycle. We're coming out of it now, and we're, we're uh, in much better shape today. But I wanted to, a lot of you have recognized this, this diagram or something similar to it. And here's some places you can find it. Um, notice, okay, this one I downloaded today, April 18th, 2023. SFI is 167 which is awesome. The sunspot number is 145, which is awesome. And a couple of other things to note on this kind of a diagram. Notice what it is uh, telling us here. It will give us the HF conditions, which is probably what most of us are interested in. So it's saying um, 80 meters, 40 meters at night. It's going to be good during the day, poor. So it'll kind of give you a prediction of what you're going to expect for propagation across the different bands. We'll be talking about some of these parameters a bit more. And the easy place you can go to see this is from qrz.com, which I think most of you are familiar with. There's a little block there. Um, the author is Paul Herman, N0NBH, which I've misspelled here, I see. It's N0NBH. But he has it um, on his site. It's also on his uh, QRZ page. So th those are three places you can go to get it. You, he also has little applets that you can actually install as a background on your, on your desktop if you care to. What I've done here, uh, I've, I've put some red blocks around some of the parameters that will are either important to us as, well, I guess they're all important to us as hams, but that we've talked about uh, maximum usable frequency, we talked about more in the general class. And when this, when I put this one up, it was uh, at 1309, 1300 is nine o'clock in the morning here on the East Coast. So that, uh, the maximum usable frequency was 13.44, and I was, as it was going through reviewing for the class tonight, it was uh, this afternoon, I saw that that was up to about 26 megahertz. So it's kind of interesting to see how this changes throughout the day. This is continu continually updated or, or updated several times an hour, I should say. Now, here's, here's some interpretation and here's some of the practical stuff. You'll see these numbers and they won't mean anything to you. But the solar flux index, here's a little, little chart, 150 I 
or more is ideal propagation. Notice where we are today, 167. That is awesome. Here's some other ones. The one that we saw before, it was from a couple of years ago, I think it was 67 or something like that. Horrible. The sunspot number is the other thing that will be very important to you. Is it him? SN, sunspot number, 150, exceptional, and where we are today, 145, which is ideal. So the conditions today were, were very good, or are very good. There's two documents that you may be interested in, in having a look at, and these links will work when you get the, uh, the file tomorrow. Gary normally sends them out the day after our class. This um, beginner's guide, the author of the beginner's guide was very frustrated because he was seeing diagrams like this and they made no sense whatsoever to him. And he couldn't find anything on the internet that was sort of a beginner's guide, so he wrote one. And I've got a picture, actually let me move it over here on our calculator cam of the uh, first page of, uh, of this document. It's, it's only five pages long, but it goes through the important numbers that are on this chart and will help you interpret them. The second link is a um, listing of, it's a glossary actually, from the author of, of this diagram, N0NBH. This also is excellent. It's more stuff than you'd ever want to know, but it's a good reference uh, to use in decoding these kinds of diagrams. So with that, let's move on to the parameter BZ. In fact, let me flip back here. Does BZ appear here? Yes, it does. It's saying 4.2 oriented in a southwesterly direction. Well, what in the world does that mean? This actually won't be very useful to you, other than uh, there are a couple of pool questions, so I wanted to cover it. But in your day-to-day -day activities, you won't uh, normally be too concerned about BZ. It measures the direction and strength of the interplanetary magnetic field. Well, what in the world of, is, is that? <laughs> You're probably wondering, well, that, that has to do with the magnetic properties of, of the solar wind. That, that would be impinging upon the Earth. So here's the sun, here's the solar wind, which is just junk coming off the surface of the sun toward the Earth that has a magnetic field. When BZ goes negative, BZ goes from negative 50 to plus 50. When it's negative, the solar wind strongly couples to the Earth's magnetosphere. That means that it's northern, uh, call it its north pole, and the south pole of the solar wind is aligned with the north pole and south pole of the uh, Earth. And that has the maximum amount of impact. And you can think of BZ as a door that allows transferring of significant amounts of energy. So some of that energy from the sun is going to be coupling into the, into the Earth, magnetic energy. The more negative it goes, the more energy that can be transferred, resulting in more geomagnetic activity. And w which is good and which is bad, we'll touch on that in a minute. Now some of the measurements. Solar wind adds to Earth's geomagnetic field and upper atmosphere. So that's the interaction that I was talking about. And finally, some uh, pool-related uh, facts. BZ represents the direction and strength of the interplanetary magnetic field. So there'll be typically a number and a, and a direction. If negative, it aligns north to south like the Earth's magnetic field. This is called a southward orientation. The southward orientation may cause disturbed conditions. Disturbed conditions is another way of saying that propagation will be affected in a negative way. It's sort of like a disturbed mental condition that affects you in a negative way also. But BZ does not have an impact on that. You'll have to talk to your psychiatrist yeah. if you have that issue. So 
So note, note the blue. Moving on to ge uh, geomagnetic field and measurements. These are definitely related. Remember we talked about the K index and the A index when we went through some of the uh, general materials. Well, they're, they're popping up here again. The K index has to do with, um, well, both K and A have to do with um, geomagnetic measurements. The indexes that are, are shown here, K goes from zero to 400. Rising A or K index indicates an increasing disruption of the mag geomagnetic field. So in an ideal world where propagation is gonna be at its very best, A and K should be very low. Now very low for A, I, I believe it means like from zero to five. And K is something close to zero. I saw one author uh, provide an, al an analogy. It, when you've got a low A and K, it's like skipping a rock over a smooth pond. Good propagation. If you've got a high A and K, it's like skipping a rock off a pond during a hurricane. So I, I thought that that was, a, was an interesting analogy. Then we've got geomagnetic storminess. It's based on A and K. It's just another parameter that's, that's derived from this. These are all uh, indicators of geomagnetic activity and how they, how they affect the Earth and propagation. So the G index goes from 0 to 5, and it's based on these other numbers. And there is a pool question that asks what G5 means. Well, the space weather term G5 means an extreme geomagnetic storm, which is going to really mess up propagation and could even cause a radio blackout. A radio blackout is when you turn on your radio, especially when you're about to do a contest, and the first thing you ask is, did my antenna fall down? Because there's no signals there whatsoever. doesn't happen very often. But stay out of your Gulf Stream. Yes. Yes, true. Yep. Yeah, some of these parameters do affect uh, high altitude pilots, by the way. So there's some other measurements, flux, flares, and, and storminess. The things that we were talking about previously uh, relate to the solar wind and uh, geomagnetic properties. Uh, flux, flares, and storminess uh, can refer to uh, UV emissions, ultraviolet, which come in the form of light, get to the earth very quickly. The three, and there, there's a little trick here. Um, if you can remember that 304A, if you can associate A with angstrom, you'll be able to pull out the correct answer in the pool question. The 304A solar parameter measures UV emissions at 304 angstroms, the light wavelength, which correlates well to solar flux and sunspot number. It's just that this is a lot easier to measure. Solar flare intensity. Now, they're rated uh, with, with letters A, B, M, and X. And then beyond X, you've got X1, X2, etc. So solar flare intensity, there is one pool question that gives you all of these letters and asks which is the most severe. Well, it's X. Each X value is a multiple of the X1 level, so X1, X2, X3. And then an X3 flare is 50% more intense than an X2. If any of you looked at our previous videos, we had some controversy the last time we taught this about uh, if it was 50% or, or, or double. <laughs> and there was kind of a funny story there. In the previous set of pool questions, they had a different answer. And we taught it that way for three years, and that was the correct answer. Um, but <laughs> then when the next pool question, uh, the next pool came out, the answer was different. <laughs> so this, if, if you looked at our, one of our previous, yeah, who, who'd have thunk it? So somebody ac actually asked me that when we, when we taught this the last time, and 
I said, are you sure about that, Dave? Because the book said something different. And the poll question said something different. This is the current. This is the current This one. is correct. This is correct. Yes, yes. So just in case you saw a previous video, I, I wanted to clear up that confusion. But for some, some reason, that was wrong for three years, and that's the way all of the ham tests were. If I remember correctly, the book was saying that each level was 50% more than the previous, right? Correct, yeah. So an X3 is 50% more intense than an X2, just a different way, different words for saying the same thing you just did. Yep, correct. Now the G index, okay, it runs from zero through five, and a G5 represents an extreme geomagnetic storm. All right, so some things to catch there. Now, I've, I've got a video. There's no audio that goes with this, but it, it kind of gives a, a very nice demonstration of, of what's going on here. Let's see if this will work for us. Okay, so there's the sun, and it's going to blow off a, probably a coronal mass injection here in a second. There, he, there it comes. It's headed toward the Earth. These don't all head toward the Earth, but this one does. And you can see what happens. It sort of engulfs the Earth kind of snaps back, and, and then we see some effects at the North and South Pole. Remember what we said about the, the poles attracting some, some of that material. Uh, not, not only can that happen, but it um, also uh, creates another effect known as aurora. Let, let me, since that's so short, let, let me do that again. Well, there's the sun. It's always blowing off some stuff. Here comes the coronal mass injection, I'm assuming is what that is. It hits the magnetosphere of the Earth, deforms it. It winds up uh, depositing or, or en entering the Earth's uh, magnetosphere at the North and South Poles. There are a whole bunch of references that are, are just fascinating. Most of you probably won't want to go too much further than the information necessary to, to pass the exam, but th this is so interesting. I, I wanted to provide these things. This one here, uh, Propagation and Radio Science by Eric Nichols, is a, a masterful treatment of the subject that doesn't go into uh, all of these parameters in great depth, uh, but is very practical. I think this is out of print. I, I had to put up a new link here today. Uh, this will take you to the Amazon used book um, area, and they're about 20 bucks uh, used. It's uh, the ARRL put it out. They must not have sold very many because it doesn't seem to be that, um, that, that they're available as, as new anymore, but it, it's great. Uh, the ARRL handbook has an excellent section on propagation spaceweather.com, the Solar Dynamics Observatory. NOAA has some terrific stuff out there. NASA, uh, a little bit more from the NOAA general site. And the DX Atlas is a resource used by HAMS um, that, that has all kinds of propagation and space weather information available on it. So uh, again, all of these links will work in the, uh, in the, from the presentation copy that, that Gary will send out. So if you want more, there, there's lots here. Another thing that I find very useful, um, I have these frequencies programmed into my transceiver, and you can very quickly tell which bands are dead, and which bands are active, just by flipping through these uh, frequencies uh, in upper sideband mode. So I, I, I can scan from 160 megahertz through six megahertz. 160 meters. 160 meters, thank you, Gary. That's actually 1.8 megahertz. But I, I can scan through all of these bands in about 10 seconds just to determine which ones are active right now and which ones aren't. So that, that's just as are there the... Beacons? Are there beacons on these? Well, the way that I'm describing this, I'm sort of using the FT8 frequencies as a beacon <laughs> because there's so many hams on FT8 um, that if, if you can't hear anything on the FT8 frequencies, the, the band probably is pretty dead. And uh, today, a little earlier, everything, well, around noon or so, 
everything from uh, 40 meters up was, was extremely active. And then if you want to go a step further, if, if you actually get the WSJT software, which is free, and then uh, tune to these bands, you can see uh, where the propagation is open uh, from or to. For example, you might see all kinds of European stations being decoded on 20 meters. Then you'll know that 20 so meters... Pan adapter, you can see real quick. Yeah, pan adapter, yep, pan adapter would do the same thing for you. Yep. So this is, this is a, a, a propagation indicator that I find handy. Uh, we, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Earlier you talked about BZ, and uh, we talked about it being negative. Was negative means uh, bad propagation? Yeah, negative would be, be bad. That, that's when it, uh, it's aligned in a manner that um, reacts destructively with, with the Earth's magnetosphere. Okay. Well, I was just watching the that that um, whole meter thing on one of those sites, and when you first started talking about it, it was at one, and now it's at negative one point nine, and so it changes fairly quickly. Yeah, they they update that um, somewhat frequently, but it's the the range is from negative fifty to positive fifty, so one one point nine that that would be close to zero, that that wouldn't be major. And I, I find, um, I don't know if, if, if any of you have run across uh, Tamitha Scove's videos, but um, she's really a lot of fun. If, if, you, if you listen to the local weather forecast on your TV, they talk about uh, the chances of rain and uh, what the temperatures are going to be today, that sort of thing. Well, she puts out a space weather forecast that talks about magnetic activity and sunspots, and uh, it, it's, it's just... It's really fun to watch one of her space weather forecasts. And I, I put the most recent one down here at the bottom. It's from April 16th, just two days ago. And uh, it's if we have tons of time when we get done tonight, which we probably won't, uh, we, we might want to come back and um, just, just play a little bit of this. But you, you can click the link tomorrow and uh, and watch this. But highly 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 recommend that you... Uh, at least see that once. You might become addicted and want to watch it all the time after that because it's quite interesting, especially if you're a DX chaser. So she also has a, a website, spaceweatherwoman.com, and a YouTube channel with all kinds of uh, information available. Okay, now we'll get on to some questions. I'll spotlight here. Which of the following descriptors indicates the greatest solar flare intensity? That's M. Yep. Did I say M? I meant X. Yeah. <laughs> it's delta, which is class X, the highest one. How does the intensity of an X3 flare compare to that of an X2 flare? Bravo. Bravo. Yep. Bravo, 50%. What does the 304A solar parameter measure? Remember what the A stands uh, for? Bravo. 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 UV emissions at the 304 angstroms, at three, 304 angstroms, which correlates to the solar flux index. What is indicated by a rising A or K index? Alpha. Alpha, yep, it's increasing disruption of the geomagnetic field, which will have a negative impact on propagation. What does the value of BZ represent? Charlie. Yes, Charlie, direction and strength of the interplanetary magnetic field. What orientation of BZ increases the likelihood that incoming particles from the sun will cause disturbed conditions. Alpha. Alpha. Yep, that's the southward. That's when the poles are, when, when, when its property is lined up with the Earth's um, north and south magnetic poles. What does the space weather term G5 mean? Alpha. Alpha. Yes, alpha, an extreme geomagnetic storm. And now we'll move on to Section 
HF propagation. So there's three ways that a signal can get from point A to point B. We've got something called space wave, or point to point. It's from one antenna looking at another antenna. That's also called line of sight. Transmit and receive antennas actually see each other. Then ground wave, which is the second one, where signals will hug the ground travel along the Earth's surface, and then sky wave, or skip as we often call it. Signals go up to the sky and return to the Earth after refraction from the ionosphere. So those are the three ways. We'll be getting into more detail. So here we have a tower. We've got the ionosphere. We've got ground wave depicted this way. It, it follows the curvature of the ground. With ground wave, we're always dealing with a vertical antenna with ground wave. The upper half of the antenna here, the lower half of the wave is actually the ground. And it hugs the ground because the ground is very lossy. These, these don't typically go very far. I'll have a diagram that shows it. And then the one that we're here, we've talked about at some length, the um, skip or sky wave, the signal will go up into the ionosphere, be bent back down again, refracted, come back down to the ground. And depending upon the angle, uh, the launch angle of, of the signal, it may come up here and come down short, go up further, come down long. So di different distances. And there's a zone between where ground wave stops, you can talk about this fire with ground wave, but you can't hear anything. Another station can't hear you until it goes up to the ionosphere and comes back down. So this distance from where ground wave stops and the first hop comes down is called the skip zone. So if, if you're wanting to talk to somebody in the skip zone, you're not gonna be successful. I have a question. Sure. On ground wave, how far did that really go, I mean, travel wise, compared to bouncing the wave waves off the atmosphere? It, it's much less, and I'll, I'll have a chart that'll show you that in a minute. The first, uh, these can be 1,500 to 2,500 miles, depending on if you're going up to the E layer or the F layer. Ground wave is, uh, you're lucky if you can get 100 miles. On, on the lower the lower ground bands. Wave is pretty much a function of your power and your own power. Well, power is important, yeah, but usually a maximum of about a hundred miles with true ground wave. But more more coming up on that. So here's another view. So here we've got the bounce going on from the ionosphere. This one is showing multiple hops. It goes up comes back down, bounces off the earth, goes up. And you could literally go all the way around the world this way. The ground wave goes much less far. And an, an AM radio transmitter would be an example of that. So now a little bit more on ground wave propagation. We're always talking about HF, uh, about vertical antennas. The lower part of the radio wave loses energy because of losses in the ground, mostly absorbed. And this refraction is, is due to the fact that the lower portion of the wave is causing the wave to tilt forward slightly and causes the uh, radio signal to follow the curvature of the Earth. And some blue text, as frequency increases, ground wave propagation decreases. So at 10 meters, 28 megahertz, you might be lucky to get a, just a couple of miles. At 160 meters, low frequency, um, can be closer to 100 miles. And here's the chart that I alluded to before. So here we have uh, frequency in megahertz. 
the two area would be like 160 meters. 30 megahertz would be close to 10 meters. Well, in fact, some of the bands are crawled out here. So you, you can see that the distance, 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles, is going to increase as frequency decreases. So ground wave propagation is useful primarily on 160, 80, and, and a little bit on, on 40. So that gives you the relationship of, of frequency and, and distance. Some key points that we're going to see in pool questions. Vertical polarization is best for ground wave propagation. In fact, vertical polarization is about the only way you can get ground wave propagation. And if you think of AM broadcast stations, here's a picture of one. That might help you remember that vertical polarization and ground wave are connected. Effective primarily on the lower ham bands. And as frequency increases, ground wave propagation distance decreases. So it's very poor on 10 meters. It's relatively good on, on 80 meters. We've talked about the ionosphere in, in, in the past. These are the layers that we wind up getting uh, when the sun is shining. D, E, F1, F2. A bit more here. We've got the Earth's surface. We've got some antennas. Normally, we're not going to be using dish antennas <laughs> if, if we're <laughs> going to be going, uh, you know, up. It'll probably be Yagi's or verticals or wire antennas. It's just somebody's idea. It's sometimes the artist, uh, the artist that, that draws these things is, isn't a ham, so they don't know any better. We'll forgive them. So this is an example of space wave where the antennas can see each other. Ionospheric layers, D, E, and F, and some relative distances here. There's another concept. I don't think there's a pool question on this, but many of you have heard of near vertical incident sky wave propagation. Uh, and the, what, what that's referring to is that if this is our transmitting location, that's an idea of a signal going up and coming almost straight down again, just within um, you know, ten, tens of miles, for example. So that this is pretty handy. The military uses it. Um, mountainous areas use it because you, you can get over a mountain this way. And uh, this station over here, it says, oops, too far away. So near vertical incident sky wave is kind of straight up and, and straight down. So it, it's a good thing just to understand that concept. I know where Dave Kastler uh, lives. Uh, they, they are in an area where N NVIS is very helpful to them. The way that you achieve that is if you have a dipole and you have it very close to the ground, like way less than a quarter of a wavelength, that tends to set, send the signal straight up. Those are also called cloud burner antennas. Kind of poetic. A bit more on sky wave propagation. Signals that travel up into the ionosphere can be refracted or bent and return to the Earth some distance away. We saw this diagram before. And the reason that the refraction happens is because the ionized gases uh, cause the radio to slow down, which bends the wave. Very similar to light in, in, a, in a prism. The, the difference in density causes a different amount of refraction. Now, the, what really excites hams well, is being able to talk to people all around the, all around the world. So sky wave or uh, propagation via the ionosphere is, is very popular. We, we like it. So one hop skip distance for the F layer it can be about 2,500 miles. That's a good, good long way, like from South Carolina to California, I think is in that range. One hop distance for the E layer, remember the E is a little bit uh, closer to the Earth, it's about 1,500 miles. And that's possible for, uh, it says first hop here, Skyway first hop, we can 
go back up again, back down again, and actually get all the way around the Earth. Now, there's something really freaky that happens when a radio signal is transmitted up to the ionosphere. If we're horizontally polarized or vertically, vertically polarized when we're down here at the Earth, when we go through the ionosphere, the polarization gets modified. Very, very strange. Independent waves called ordinary and extraordinary waves are created in the ionosphere. So they actually can change polarization as a result of going through the ionosphere. Kind of a technically technical statement here. When linear, linearly polarized radio waves, that means horizontal or vertical, split into ordinary and extra, extraordinary waves in the ionosphere, they become elliptically polarized. Just some words that they want us to know. And the fact that these radio waves are splitting can cause some interesting effects. You've, some of you have heard of one-way propagation. That's where you can hear somebody calling CQ. You know that your um, radio is working fine, but they can't hear you. That can be a result of um, these radio waves splitting because the waves take different paths through the ionosphere, or they can. Dave? Yep. Is there a way to tell if you're using E layer or F layer? I've heard conversations before listening, and I've heard people saying that uh, it was F layer and stuff like this, but is there actually a way to know? Um, there is. The first hop will come down in a different place. E, e layer, you'll have a good signal at about um, uh, 1,200 miles, for example. If you've got, if you're talking to somebody 1,200 miles away or away, that's probably going to be E layer. Uh, 2,500 miles is the uh, first hop for F layer. Out beyond that distance, though, it would be kind of hard to know how many how many how many hops occurred. There is a, a technical way that that hams don't use, but there's a, a tool called an ionosonde that is actually an upward fi firing radar that, that will cause um, signals to bounce back from the ionosphere to clearly identify the E and the F layers. I've got a little section at the very end of this, if we have time, where I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more. But um, the, that's... Dave, Dave yep. aren't there some uh, what they call inverse whisper, where there's whisper receivers connected to internet and report back. Uh, yes, ab PTH. absolutely. You wouldn't necessarily know if you're on the E layer or the F layer, but um, I'll, I'll probably comment on, on Whisper a, a little bit later in our in our presentation, but that that is a, a tool that can be used for, for checking out propagation. So ho hopefully I came close to answering the question. So um, the one that we didn't talk about yet is ray tracing. Ray tracing is kind of a complex mathematical uh, modeling method that models a radio wave's path through the ionosphere. I think that what the pool question committee wanted us to just to know was just that you know, what is that term, ray tracing? Because uh, it doesn't necessarily just come up and, and come back down again. No, I'll show you, you that. Really gotta, you really have to have a really good handle on what your antenna is doing. Well, this too, right? you usually you ropes. you usually won't know because an antenna, although the the diagrams that we show uh, show pencil beams basically going up into the ionosphere and coming down, it's actually more like a poorly focused flashlight beam. Even if you're using a a, a Yagi antenna, most of your energy will will be going in a general direction. But it's it's going all over the place. So, um, yeah, you you may be able to, to uh, compare antennas, and a, a Yagi will probably give you more signal strength in a distant location. But the reality is that you're probably going to be heard all over the place when, once it gets up there and comes back down again. It's more of a spray effect than a, than a pencil point. So some things here just to review. So we'll see him again. Okay. Now, chordal hop is another concept, and in this case, I think I have a better 
yeah, here we go. Better, better picture. So we, we can shoot things up into the ionosphere and maybe they'll get stuck up there. In this case, it says the F region. So it, it, it'll be up here and it'll stay there for a long time before it comes back down again. It all depends upon the, the takeoff ag angle of, of the signal. And the reason quartal hop is kind of a good thing is because all of the time and attenuation that you get from going, you know, doing multiple hops, you avoid all of that attenuation and the time that it takes by, by staying up here. In fact, that's how uh, scientists discovered that quartal hop or quartal mode was a real thing because when the signal came down, it, it got there too fast because it didn't have to go up and down and up and down and up and down. So that's, um, that's known as what, uh, that's what is known as, as chordal hop. It doesn't happen very often. And chord, if, if the, uh, the, the term, some of you uh, in, from geometry class remember that a chord is a line bisecting, bisecting a circle, you can kind of see that concept here. Now, just a little advanced peek here. There's something showing as sporadic E, which we haven't talked about. Occasionally, electron clouds form in the E region that causes another type of propagation known as sporadic E, which we'll get into in, a, in another slide. Just a little preview. So with that picture, let's kind of go back to this. The primary primary characteristic of chordal hop is successive ionospheric reflections without an inter intermediate reflection from the ground, which we saw here. More efficient because it doesn't have to return to Earth. It may go a really long distance. Remember I said the F, F layer could go 2,500 miles? Well, a chordal hop can go much further than that. And it's desirable because the signal experiences less loss along the path compared to normal skip. There's our picture again. Now moving on to another subject. Uh, this whole chapter is rich in a lot of, of subtopics, kind of a potpourri of facts about propagation. So moving to polar now, polar paths are more likely to experience high levels of absorption when the A or K index is elevated. So if you remember um, when we have interaction with the, the sun, the solar wind, those um, particles that are able to enter the Earth's magnetosphere are going to come in at the poles, kind of like a doorway for, these, uh, for this effect. Therefore, the polar paths are more likely to experience high levels of absorption. When ionization becomes too high, um, that's when radio signals tend to be absorbed rather than refracted. A sudden rise in background noise may indicate a solar flare has occurred. Um, and Gary had a comment the last time we talked about this, <laughs> which I thought was good. The absence of signals can also be interpreted as an increase in, in noise and also due to a solar... Yeah. I was listening on my radio. I had great signals and then they were gone. Yep. And I thought I lost my antenna. I lost my cable and I'm, you know, checking nothing, nothing, mm -hmm. nothing. Go on the internet. Oh, that's yep. what's happened. Yep, exactly. Yep. And go to the space weather sites and, and, and see, um, see what's going on. So th these are two different concepts, but uh, they're, they're both important. Let's back up to that. So this one has to do with the uh, polar paths and th this has to do with the effect of a, of a solar flare. And it was a solar flare that I experienced. Okay. So now we're going to move on to another topic relating to SkyWave. We've got something called long path and short path propagation. Now the circumference of the Earth, if you were to, to jump, uh, if you were to go outside and walk all the way around, you'd be walking 25,000 miles. I guess you'd have to swim part That's of the way. That's a long measuring tape. It's a long measuring tape, yes. So short path, if you consider the circumference of the Earth is 25,000 miles, short path would be less than 12,500. And what, why is that? You're probably wondering. Well, once you get to 
12,500 miles away, you are on the exact opposite uh, point of the Earth than where you started from. That's also called an antipode. And then as you're walking back toward your uh, point of origination, it's going to be tw less than 12,500 miles as, as you start going home again. So just hang on to that for a second. Hopefully it'll make sense. So the long path distance would be 25,000 miles minus the short path distance. And here's an example of Tokyo to Pittsburgh. 6,600 um, 6, miles at 328 degrees. The long path, if you were to go around the Earth in the opposite direction, would be 18,381 miles at an opposite bearing. So the, the two of them should add up to about 25,000 miles, which it looks like they do. So from an antenna, you can reach your, your friend a thousand miles away, either by going direct from your location to the thousand miles to your friend, or if you have a directional antenna, you could turn it around the other way and uh, reach, reach your friend by multiple hops going around the earth. That's the concept of, of long path. And I, I think Gary has a story. Don't you have a friend that you... Well, um, yeah, so I was uh, uh, gotten back into ham radio back in the mid-1980s, uh, working at a TV station in Michigan, and a lot of the engineers there were hams. And um, my uh, the chief engineer, Greg Surma, K8GL. Hi, Greg. Uh, he's still on the air up in uh, uh, Michigan. Uh, but uh, he uh, went with, I think, a group uh, down to Montserrat. Uh, and was going to operate a station down there, Victor Papa 2, Mike United. I remember that. And so we set up a schedule. I was going to call him, and I had a, a directional four element uh, Tet Yagi. So I pointed it you know, to the, the southeast uh, toward Montserrat from, from Michigan. Nothing. Nothing. And I kept calling and, and could hear nothing. So on a whim, I turned it 180 degrees. There he was. Long path. Yep. Went around the Earth the opposite direction, so that that's the concept, and it, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. Here's another one. If you notice an echo on a signal, you could try to turn your beam 180 degrees for a long path, because it takes about a seventh of a second for a signal to go all the way around the, the Earth. I've, I've got a friend who was kind of joking, and his wife is a ham as well, so he told his wife if he... Uh, was talking to her. She, he's on one end of the house, she's on the other end of the house, and if, if there's a one-seventh second delay, he's talking to her long path. Of course, that, that wouldn't actually happen, but it was kind of cute. An echo on a received signal may be caused by receiving a signal by more than one path, long path and short path. You, you might hear that once or twice in your ham career. I've never heard it. I just heard it this week. Oh, did you? Yeah. Wow. Okay. So for reference, it takes about a seventh of a second to go all the way around the Earth, and the human perception is about 30 milliseconds So for, for echo. So that's uh, just interesting information. Now there's another concept called gray line, which we'll be getting into in, uh, in more detail. Now, 20 meters is the most common, and first, first of all, let's finish up on long, long path. Gray path will be at the, at the end, gray line. 20 meters is the most common band to experience long path propagation. Something to remember. Usually, short path is best for, for shorter distances because the signal will be so strong that uh, the, the long path would be obliterated. Unless, of course, you're in a skip zone, like Gary was describing. Now, here we're going, starting to blend into the gray line a little bit. Long path is usually observed either along the gray line or over the nighttime side of the Earth. Now, gray line is the terminator between light and darkness. And I'll have a diagram of that. And it, gray line can be effective because the D layer disappears rapidly at, at night. Now, I messed up my animation here. And long path propagation is supported on 160 through 10 meters. So 
uh, what, what bands might you be able to experience Long Path? Well, basically all of the HF bands, 160 through 10 meters. And this diagram hopefully will make it a bit more clear. We've got Mr. Sun over here, North Pole, South Pole of the Earth. So the Sun is illuminating half of the Earth. The other half of the Earth is in darkness. So we've got day and night. So we've got this terminator between day and night called the gray line. So station A and station B are, are much more likely to be able to talk to one another along the gray, gray line um, compared to other, other times of the day. So this, this is this is a propagation effect that can be very, very useful for working DX. Now, because the Earth rotates on its axes throughout the year, um, these points will come up in different places. And of course, the time of day and time of night will affect this. So you, you can plan your DX contacts based on working people along the gray line. So the day, the day side, yeah. go ahead. The Earth rotates about 15 degrees an hour. Okay, yep, so, so it's 15 degrees in our longitude. Yep, you have to be paying attention to where you, if, if there's some rare DX that you're after, you've got to be paying attention to what time of the day um, and, and, and where they are. There's pre prediction tools that will help you with all of this. So the day side has an ionized F2 layer, and the night side is just coming into sunlight, so it hasn't had time to ionize and absorb lower frequency RF, which is the reason that the gray line propagation works. So it's double benefits to lower frequency propagation. So dawn and dusk are the times when you would experience this. Now here's uh, what's called the Mercator projection. Now the reason that we have Mercator projections is because uh, when you take a globe and then flatten it out, so that you can represent it on a piece of paper, it winds up looking like this. We saw the gray line here as a nice straight line, also known as a great circle path. When we open that up and put it on a piece of paper, it winds up looking like this, which is called a Mercator projection, sphere versus flat. Kessler had a really excellent demo of, of how this works and the Earth tilt uh, varies with the time of year, the, the solstices and uh, uh, equinox times. And DX Atlas has, has a tool, that's the tool that Kessler was using when he was doing his demo. A little bit more on gray line. We're, we're seeing the Terminator right here. The cause of gray line propagation at twilight and sunrise, twice during the day, D layer absorption is low, while E layer and F layer remains high. That's what, that's what gives you that advantage. Another unrelated fact, but it's important, if DX signals become too weak to copy across an entire HF band, means the propagation is probably going out a few hours after sunset, so starting to go weak a few hours after sunset, try switching to a lower frequency HF band. What's happening is that um, we're, we're losing propagation um, it, it is, uh, after dark. So here we're showing the sun in relation to the earth. And as the earth turns, this is going to change. So the key is to try switching to lower frequency HF band. If, if uh, 10 meters is going out on you, start at 20 and keep going down. Now fading, I don't believe there's a pool question here, but um, I, I did want to comment uh, about uh, some ways that fading can be com combated. QSB is the Q code for fading. The ionosphere is complex. Well, that is a severe understatement. Now, what happens is that um, you can have, because your uh, signals are splitting, once they get up to the ionosphere, they can come back down to your receiving station in different phases, and they, they can cancel one another. 
So there, there's two um, approaches that aren't used very much by hams uh, called spatial diversity and polarization diversity. If we've got some signals canceling because of multiple signals coming in, chances are a few wavelengths away, if you had a separate site, you wouldn't have both of them, uh, th those phase relationships would be different. And um, in commercial radio, it is common to have what are called voting receivers, where different sites will be receiving a signal and then just passing on the stronger one to the person that, that's wanting to hear it. Um, commercial two-way radio does that, and I, I think some of your stuff did too, Gary, didn't it? Yeah, and in Voice of America, predating uh, satellites, um, they used uh, high frequencies to send uh, program material from the United States uh, to overseas transmitting stations. And uh, we also monitored overseas broadcasts from other countries coming into the United States. And in Greenville, North Carolina, when they had Seaside open, it was a receiver site. And they had big rhombic antennas uh, pointed toward Europe or other locations, and they'd have pairs of them. And they'd have an RCA voting high frequency receiver, one listening on one rhombic, the other listening on the other. Uh, and whichever had the better signal at that time, it would switch right in the middle of the broadcast and it would be seamless uh, and it would always maintain uh, the highest uh, level of uh, reception. That's a bit dramatic for hams to do, but yep. um, you know, we had the money, we could do it. <laughs> exactly, that, that's called space diversity. The other one is polarization diversity. We, we mentioned that um, we have the, the uh, signals split and become the ordinary and extraordinary. Um, and they're, they're, they differ in phase. So if you had a, a transceiver with two re, uh, that had two separate receivers and you had a vertically uh, polarized antenna and a horizontally polarized antenna, you could put those on your left and right ear on your transceiver and you can actually hear as one of them fades out, the other one would come up. Um, so uh, radios with two receivers, that, that's a possible thing that you can do as a ham. Uh, but you have to have two antennas, one horizontal and one, one vertically polarized. So just interesting um, side light related to propagation. No pool questions there. Now there's some prediction software. Uh, there's many tools and websites. I'll be listing some of them. Uh, Voice of America, which Gary has heard of once or <laughs> twice, um, uses something called uh, vocap software, which models HF propagation. Here's a link. It's up and running. Scary likes to say your tax dollars at work. So here's a picture of uh, a VOA cap. And you, here you can see the gray line. And here you can see uh, two locations that you're trying to model. So you, you can put that in and it'll tell you the time of day and the uh, frequency band that would give you the best chance of making that contact. So that's available to you right now, and it's free. This is something that I did this afternoon, about 3 o'clock. Um, I got on 10 meters and worked uh, FT8. Um, they, they also track CW and some other modes, but for me, FT8 was the easiest. I got on 10 meters for about um, maybe 5-6 minutes and attempted to work somebody way over here grab the right mouse. I wasn't, he was calling um, CW, trying to remember where, where it was. It wasn't Tasmania, but it, it was this location here. Um, and what PSK Reporter does is it will decode my transmitted signal in reporting stations all over the earth. There's about 7,000 of them all together. Um, this is where I was heard. I never made my contact that I, w I was wanting to. It was, would have been an all-time new one. I was excited to try to do that. Is that Kurabati? No. Um, that, that's what I, this, probably what this is, but I don't remember the, the name of the country that I was chasing. But at any rate, these are all the locations around the world that heard me trying to do that because they decoded my, uh, my transmission. So this is pretty fascinating. And if you actually go on... Um, pskreporter.com, 
com or org, I'm not sure which, if you, if you Google PSK report, it would come up. Then you can actually put in my call sign and um, tell it that you want 10 meters. Uh, the data stays up for 24 hours. Uh, and if you pass your mouse over any of these points, uh, it will tell you where that listening station is and what my received signal strength was. This, this was the place. Now, it, what's interesting is the, the person I was trying to call, um, there were so many people trying to work him, he just couldn't get to them all. And I only had five minutes to, to fool with this. But um, his station was actually one that, that reported me. <laughs> so he was able to hear me. He just couldn't get to me with everybody else calling at the same time. So this, this is another tool that's available to you that, that uh, uh, it'll, it'll decode CW and FT8 and uh, some other, other modes as well. All right, so we'll get on to some questions now. Um, oh, there's a couple of other tools too. Um, we, we had mentioned VOACAP, uh, PSK Reporter, uh, the Reverse Beacon Network is, is another system that's out there that you can put in your call sign and see where you were decoded. Um, and, I, I know, oh, and Whisper, Whisper is the other one. Uh, WSPR is a, a mode in the, F, the WSJTX suite of programs and they have specific frequencies where you can transmit as if you were a beacon and tell where you were picked up and, and how strong you were. So the, these are all things available to you. So some questions now. How does the maximum range of ground wave propagation change when the signal frequency is increased? You have to kind of read through those words carefully. We're talking ground wave. So how does the maximum range change when the signal frequency is increased? Charlie. Charlie, it decreases, yeah. So you get the worst ground wave at 10 meters, best at 160. What type of polarization is best for ground wave propagation? It's alpha vertical, right? I think I heard that in there somewhere. In fact, that's the only kind of polarization that works with ground wave. What might help to restore contact when DX signals become too weak to copy across an entire HF band a few hours after sunset? Bravo. Yep, Bravo. switch to a, a lower frequency HF band, correct. Why is chordal hop propagation desirable? Alpha. Alpha. Oh, delta. While it is alpha, the signal experience is less loss compared to multi-hop using Earth as a reflector. Because remember, chordal hop will go a long distance without needing to hop. So there, therefore, there's less losses. So isn't D, I mean, we talked about the wave traveling faster as well because it doesn't come back down. Okay. The, One the, or two of those others, though, are, Nate, are not true. Yeah. The, it doesn't go faster, it just goes a longer distance, distance. before it comes down because, because it's all the, it. all, all, all the speed of light. So it, yeah. it, 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 might, it, it might seem faster, but you're, it, it's microscopic. Okay, so what is the primary characteristic of chordal hop propagation? And I can see why that previous one would have been a little confusing. But this one, why is the primary characteristic of chordal hop? What is the primary char characteristic of chordal hop propagation? Bravo. Bravo. Bravo, yes. Successive ionospheric refractions that gets, kind of gets stuck up there before it comes back down without an er immediate, intermediate reflection from the ground. Correct. What is meant by the term extraordinary and ordinary waves? Bravo. Oh. Okay, bravo. Independent waves created in the ionosphere that are elliptically polarized. Remember we said that once the signal, uh, a horizontally or, or vertically polarized signal hits the ionosphere, it comes down in, uh, in, in, a, in a different way. Yep. What happens to linearly polarized waves that split into ordinary and extraordinary waves in the ionosphere? 
Charlie. They become elliptically polarized. Correct. What what does the common what does the radio communication term ray tracing describe? Looking for some guy named Ray. Yeah. <laughs> and then you trace him. <laughs> Bravo, yeah. Bravo. Modeling a radio wave's path through the ionosphere. Uh, it's probably done mostly with computer software. It's very, very technical, but the, this is the simplified version of what it, what it means. What does VOACAP software model? Charlie. It's HF propagation, because that's what Voice of America did, HF. Which of the following signal paths is most likely to experience high levels of absorption when the A and K index is elevated? Bravo. bravo. Yes, bravo. Polar. What might be indicated by a sudden rise in radio background noise across a large portion of the radio spectrum? Bravo. A solar flare has occurred. Which amateur bands typically support long path propagation? Early. Yep, it's all of them, basically, all of the HF bands, 160 through 10. Which of the following amateur bands most frequently provides long path propagation? Bravo. 20 meters. And that will wrap up uh, section 10.3. Uh, we're going to move on to section 10.4, which actually has the majority of the pool questions and the, the least amount of probably practical application to hams. But uh, that will do after the break. So you get five minutes now to uh, do something else besides listen to me, unless you like listening to me. <laughs>
All right, we're going to pick up now on the very last section of this chapter, section 10.4, just VHF, UHF, microwave propagation. And my expectation is that most of you are going to have more fun on HF than anything else. You want to talk, talk to the world. But since many of you are, are generals, you may have already gotten into some of these more specialized uh, frequency bands. So um, we do need to cover it because there's... Uh, over 20 pool questions and um, some of this is uh, some of these things you might want to get into in the future but in, in my world I, I enjoy HF so much I, I might never get into some of these things so the first concept is the radio horizon the concept here is that uh, we can be that this this is line of sight basically uh, from one antenna to another and uh, some of the early radar operators, that, that's how this concept was discovered, saw that they could actually see over the horizon a little bit. And that's, that's because there is some bending of, of the radio wave um, beyond line of sight. And that effect is good for about 15%. So whatever the line of sight difference is, plus about 15% is what uh, defines the radio horizon. It isn't just necessarily the distance that the antennas can see each other. And here you can see we've got a tower, so it, it's going through the going over the earth and then coming out over here. So you would normally think this would be as, as far as you could be heard, but it actually bends a bit and comes down about 15% further. So that's a concept of a radio horizon for line of sight communication. It's a little bit more than line of sight. And the, in the context of the pool question, downward bending due to density variations in the atmosphere causes the radio horizon to be a little further than the geome geometric horizon, a little past the geometry, by about 15%. Now there's uh, some, we're talking VHF and above now for, for some of this. This doesn't really happen on HF. But weather conditions that create a sharp transition between air layers allow radios to follow the curvature of the Earth for hundreds or thousands of miles like a waveguide. So here we've got the normal case. We've got the sun hitting the Earth. We've got hot air, cool air, and then cold air in the atmosphere. But temperature inversions can happen where we've got cold, warm, and then cold, especially uh, seen over, over water this temperature inversion can, can cause the, the ducting effect that we're talking about. So here's an example of a propagation duct, and this is down in, in the troposphere, the, the air that we breathe, and, and up a little ways we've got warm and cool air creating a, some bending and creating this duct. It's a VHF and above effect. And just another picture here. And these, these can be uh, way, way beyond line of sight, like a thousand miles, which is a, a real mind blower to think that you could talk on two meters or um, 70 centimeters and, and go that far. But this, this is a way that it can happen. Now there's a tool called a Hepburn map that will give you the probability of tropospheric propagation. So looking at these maps, and here's a, a link that'll take you there, uh, will we'll tell you when this might be possible. Now I've never used this, but Gary uh, has been running our, our VHF and UHF station for field day and for, for contests. Um, and you yeah, use we, this. Yeah, we have it there and we'll take a look and see. Uh, we'll also use uh, PSK Reporter, uh, and we'll also uh, use um, DX Maps uh, mm -hmm. to look and see what uh, how propagation is is going on on six meters and two meters uh, for field day. Uh, we mm -hmm. set up that station. So, uh, and the Hepburn maps have come into play. Uh, usually, it's after the fact. We'll make a, a long distance contact, and we'll go. How did that happen? Yep. And then we'll take a look. So that this is actually something that's, that's useful if you are a VHF and above operator. Now microwave, um, th there's some really interesting things that can happen with microwave frequencies. And microwave in this case 
Um, I'll define as 902 megahertz and up, which is the 33 uh, centimeter ham band. So atmospheric temperature inversion can create a path for microwave. That was the one we looked at here. Tropospheric propagation of microwave signals often occurs along warm and cold fronts. Again, related to this one. Inducts capable of propagating microwave often form over bodies of water. So the, these are all different ways that they approach it in the pool. Now this is tropospheric propagation of microwave signals. Be 100 to 300 miles, which, which is amazing since normally that's line of sight. past that one. And then there's even something called a rain scatter. Microwave, because of the very short wavelengths, the raindrops can actually reflect um, radio signals. And of course the rain must be within the radio range of both stations. And some hams even enjoy bouncing signals off of airplanes near, near an airport. <laughs> that, that works too. Sporadic E, we showed you a, this diagram a, a little bit earlier. Sporadic E is a, a real thing. Scientists really don't know why these uh, electron clouds form, but they do. So it'll, it, it, with sporadic E, you can bounce signals off smaller clouds of unusually ionized atmosphere in the lower E region. So uh, normally we've got... Uh, the, the single and multi-hops going on, um, sporadic E will, will show up unexpectedly. And uh, we're, again, the contact is, is VHF, because normally you don't have any um, ionospheric effects at, at VHF and above, well, sometimes on six meters, but at uh, uh, the higher frequencies, uh, 70 centimeters and up, it, the ionosphere doesn't come into play, but with sporadic E, it does become possible. Dave, does this happen with FM as well as with single sideband? Yes. Yes, yep. It doesn't care what the modulation is. Most common in the 28, which is 10 meters to 150 megahertz range. So it, it can affect 10, 6, and 2 meters. You can go a long, long way. It, it, it's just amazing when it, you can, you can talk 600 miles on two meters. And if you manage to do that, this is probably how. And there's times of the year when it's more likely for this to happen. Um, and I'll have a diagram of the uh, equinoxes and um, solstices coming up here in a second. But the, the, the key here, most likely to occur around the, the solstices, especially the summer one. It can happen any time during the day, which is also counterintuitive. Here we get the picture again, what's going on. Now the Earth tends to tilt um, throughout the year, so that's, that's where the concept of the equinoxes comes to play, or the solstices. And I'll just point out, uh, the American Radio Relay League Field Day event is the last full weekend in June, which uh, corresponds to the summer solstice. Yep, so that, that can be very handy for the person running the VHF and UHF station, which is normally Gary. VHF contests are sometimes scheduled around these times. Uh, moving on to another flavor of propagation called TE, trans-equatorial propagation. It's a form of F-layer ionospheric propagation. And since the context of this chapter is VHF and above, or this section, uh, it says it occurs on 50, 144, and uh, also higher. But it also happens on HF. I have kind of an interesting story. I, I was... Um, uh, on 10 meters, 10 meters was totally dead during the, the, uh, the low point of the sunspot cycle, the solar cycle. And, uh, but I'd, I'd still go there every now and then just to see if anything was happening. And one, one day I got there and there were a bunch of signals. They were all from Brazil. <laughs> 
That's interesting. 10 meters has been totally dead for weeks, and I'm hearing all of these stations from Brazil. Well, what in the world is going on? Well, stand by. TE, transequatorial propagation, occurs between two mid-latitude points approximately the same distance north and south of the magnetic equator. So here, here's a picture. And uh, so uh, South Carolina, which is me, was uh, hearing signals down in, in, in Brazil. I'm pretty sure that that was TE propagation. And I must have worked about uh, six or seven Brazilians uh, b before that faded out. The approximate maximum uh, range for signals using TE is about 5,000 miles, which works out to, to South, South Carolina to Brazil, believe it or not. So halfway to the equator and then, and then south for me. Best time of the day is early, is afternoon or early evening. So the pool question committee wants you to know three things about TE. Now it was talking about the um, geomagnetic equator. Remember we, we said that the true North Pole and the magnetic North Pole were different from one another by a few degrees. Well the same thing is true of the magnetic equator. So you can kind of see the equator kind of wandering around here a little bit compared to the what you would expect it to be on a, on a globe. So you see these points that are above and below the magnetic equator uh, approximately an equal distance. And the, these are paths that, that can work in this mode. So that's the concept of TE propagation. Moving on to another one here. There's a whole bunch of little odds and ends here. Auroral propagation, that means propagation in the area of, of the poles. We'll be talking mainly about the, the North Pole, but the same thing happens at the South. It's caused by an interaction in the E layer of charged particles from the Sun with the Earth's magnetic field. Well, we were talking about that concept earlier. Depending upon the degree of ionization um, and, and the impacts uh, at the poles, it, it is very possible to um, have enhanced propagation So propagation up to 1,400 miles, which again is, is mind-blowing. A little, little picture of where that can occur. Now you've heard of the aurora in terms of northern lights. There, there is a, a visible effect that we call the northern lights. Uh, the radio effect of, of, of aurora is slightly different, but they're, but they're closely related. We're not reflecting off the light, but, but the same effect um, from the solar wind uh, causes both of these things to happen. And in Tamitha uh, Scove's um, solar forecast, she talks about what latitudes you need to be at in order to see northern lights, which is interesting. CW is the best emission mode. And the reason for that is because the signals tend to be very fluttery and the sideband would be hard to understand. And the key is to point the antenna north in order to take advantage of this cloud of propagation, if you want to call it that. And here's visible aurora. And being, being a southerner, we, we never see this in South Carolina, but I used to live in Wisconsin, and every so often in, in the summer we, we'd have some of these light displays going on. This link will take you to a whole bunch of other uh, pictures. It's, it's really beautiful. There are photographers that just speci uh, specialize in taking these kinds of pictures. So another view. Here we've got, uh, again, to the north, the United States, northern U.S. People are pointing their beams up, up into this area and can come up and come down and go much longer distances than you may expect. Meteor scatter. <clears throat> okay, moving on again. This is something I've not tried, but I really would like to, uh, because this is something that you can actually do every day of the year. 
There's literally millions of meteoroids that enter the Earth's atmosphere every day. And those meteoroids, when they burn up, they have uh, an ionization trail that will reflect radio signals. Now these millions of meteoroids, a lot of them are just the size of a, of a speck of sand. And they, they'll only make a trail that, that is, would be a few feet long. And it's pretty tough to bounce radio signal off, off there. But there are enough that are large enough where this can be a real thing. And there's an article here that talks about how to get into this. And you can do it with ordinary ham equipment, which, which also is another reason I want to play with it someday. So when a meteor strikes the Earth's atmosphere, a cylindrical region of free electrons is formed in the E layer of the atmosphere. The picture. Best frequency is between 10 meters and 2 meters. 6 meters is where this is most popular. And there's a, a special mode called MSK144. It's part of the WSJTX suite of programs. And it, it it's capable of making contacts in less than 70 milliseconds because you've got to be really, really fast to catch a meteor trail and um, talk to somebody. But the, the folks that are into this make contacts almost every day. This has got quite an interesting history. They used to use high-speed CW. They'd record it on tape recorders at a super high speed, like you know, hundreds of words per minute. They'd re then uh, send it that way. Then they'd decode it on the other end on a tape recorder and then slow down the tape recorder so they could understand the CW. So <laughs> that's, that was very inventive, I think, but now it's, it's done digitally. So methods commonly used to make contacts uh, with MSK-144, it's a 15 second timed transmission. Of course, the meteors, uh, meteor opportunity is usually way less than that. So it, it will be sending out, let's say a CQ, uh, on one meteor trail, and it might not get a response until somebody responds on a different meteor trail. And uh, the software keeps track of all of that. So short transmissions with rapidly repeated call signs and signal reports is the key to making meteor scatter work. So this is the mode. And again, they've, they've given us all kinds of pool questions related to this. Just another conceptual diagram. Here we've got a meteoroid in ionized trail and stations going up and down. And this can actually happen. Uh, the, the, both sides of the conversation can occur with different trails. Another picture. Got somebody with a antenna array shooting up toward a tail. There are certain times of the year when uh, there's meteor showers, a table in our book that names these meteor showers. So although it's possible to make a, a meteor uh, scatter contact almost every day, these are when they become very um, more likely, much more likely. In fact, you can even make sideband contacts during some of these times. Moon bounce. Okay, let's move on to moon bounce. So here we've got two stations that can both see the moon at the same time. So the maximum distance would be about 2,500 miles halfway around the Earth because at opposite ends of the Earth, conceivably, both stations could see the moon. And we've got the, the moon, uh, the lunar orbit is actually somewhat elliptical. It moves back and forth. From, from the Earth. We've got perigee, which is the closest point of the Moon to the Earth, and apogee, which is the furthest. And the, um, the way that I remember this one, because there's a pool question where I need it, um, for uh, perigee, I, I, I think of that being similar to the word periscope, which makes things look closer up. Kind of, kind of a dumb analogy, but uh, to me that's how I, I make perigee and, and close um, connected. Uh, somebody else had suggested apogee and apart or away as, as the other one. So uh, somehow you've got to keep those two apart because there's a pool question. And EME is not easy. 
remember we, we said that it was about uh, 25,000 miles around the Earth if you were to go long path from one point to the other, 20, 25,000 um, halfway around. Well, the moon is 225,000 uh, miles away. Or, yeah, that is a long, long way. That's like 10 times the distance around the Earth. And from the Earth's point of view, you've got about a half a degree <laughs> that uh, is available to, to pick up the RF energy and e everything else that gets sprayed out there gets lost. So you're only getting a tiny amount of signal out there. And there's another problem with, with talking to the moon. That's that there aren't any hams, <laughs> there aren't any hams there to answer you back, <laughs> okay? So you've got to go to the moon and come back again if, if you're gonna make a contact with somebody so incredible amount of loss. It's like, like 190 dB of, of, of loss. So you, you've got to have usually power and, and the sensitive receiver and uh, WSJTX has got a, um, some modes that are specifically made for moon bounce. So there's something called libration fading. Um, the moon actually, if, if the moon was a perfect metal sphere, you'd probably never be able to bounce signals off of it because there would only be one single point on that sphere that was facing the Earth. Every, everything else would be reflecting away. But the surface of the moon is kind of rough. And therefore, uh, there's lots of places that, that the signal could reflect from, which is why we can actually bounce signals off the moon. And this is kind of amazing. The moon, the moon rocks relative to the, to the Earth. So uh, I, I don't know if this is the reason, but have you heard of the man in the moon? Most of you have. Well, maybe when he's rolling over in bed, that, that's, that's when the moon rocks a little bit. I'm, I'm not sure what the cause of that is, but there's a, an excellent Wikipedia article that uh, talks about uh, libration fading, which you can look at if you're interested. So it's, we've got an irregular surface, um, which causes um, a lot of multipath, also more things to reflect off of, and the effect is deep fading and, and peaks. You'd think that NASA would have left a uh, beacon up there, low power beacon. Uh, well, probably or not for VHF hands. Or VHF. Yeah, the millions of dollars that they invested in getting equipment to yeah. the moon. Um, it could be pro small, though. Probably wasn't for us. <laughs> but yeah, good, good point. So Joe Taylor, our friend, the WJTX uh, uh, of WSJTX fame, uh, created something called JT65, a variant of it in 2003, a long time ago, specifically for moon bounce. Uh, JT65 became very popular on the ham bands, uh, HF bands, a little bit later. Of course, now FT8 has pretty much taken over, but uh, this was specifically designed for moon bounce and uh, uses time-synced transmissions, uh, one, one minute uh, transmit, one minute receive, with lots of redundancy. But prior to that, they, it, it was very, very difficult to do moon bounce. People had to be running full legal power. They had to use uh, liquid-cooled uh, receivers, very low noise figure, and uh, incredible gain antennas to, to make this happen. Now it's... Uh, a lot closer to the reach of normal hams. You still need a, a high gain antenna, but you, you could actually do this if you were motivated to. I've never been that motivated. So stations have to be able to see the moon at the same time in order uh, for communication to occur. It seems obvious, but that will limit you to the 2,500 miles halfway around the Earth, which is what this says in context to the pool question. And you can actually achieve DXCC on some of these higher frequency bands. That means 100 countries worked. People have done that. So low noise receiving setup was ex the only way you could do it in, in the old days. But you've got to have a good receiver, uh, some power, and, and gain antennas e even today to really make this, uh, make this work. JT65 was the mode that was originally designed for EME and still used for that today. 
and an advantage of JT65's ability to decode signals which have very low signal to noise ratio. Actually signals below the noise can be decoded. And JT65 is a method of, established, of establishing contacts using time synchronous transmissions alternately from each station. That means one, you'll transmit for one minute at an exact time and then receive for one minute with the synchronized clocks. And libration fading characterized by fluttery irregular fading. Digital is much, uh, much better way to do this than the old methods. And the least path loss occurs when the moon is at perigee, perigee which is closest to Earth. It's about a 2 dB advantage. So they, they somehow managed to get a whole mess of pool questions out of EME. Speaking of which, how much does the VHF UHF radio horizon distance exceed the geometric horizon? Alpha. Yes, it is alpha, approximately 15%. Why does the radio path horizon distance exceed the geometric horizon? Delta. 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 Downward bending due to density variations in the atmosphere. What do Hepburn maps predict? Delta. 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 Yeah, probability of tropospheric propagation. Tropospheric propagation of microwave signals often occurs in association with what Phenomenon. Alpha. Well, remember um, tropospheric propagation. That means in the air, it's warm fronts and cold fronts, temperature inversions. Think tropical. Yeah, think tropical. Good, good way to do it. Warm and cold fronts. There'll be a bunch of questions on gray line coming up. <laughs> Atmospheric ducts capable of propagating microwave signals often form over what geographic feature? Charlie. Charlie. Bodies of water. What type of atmospheric structure can create a path for microwave propagation? It's our temperature inversion, common, common over water. What is a typical range for tropospheric propagation of microwave signals? Bravo. Yep, that was the 100 to 300. Um, at what time of year is sporadic E propagation most likely? Oh, oh. That was the summer uh, solstice. What time of day can sporadic E propagation occur? Delta. 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 Is any, any time. Is almost counterintuitive, but that's the right answer. What is transequatorial propagation? A lot of words to read here. Alpha. alpha. Well, it, it is alpha, propagation between two mid latitude points, think South Carolina and Brazil, at approximately the same distance north and south of the magnetic equator. Mm -hmm. What is the approximate maximum range for signals using transequatorial propagation? Charlie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Again, wow. South Carolina to Brazil. What is the best time of day for TE propagation? Charlie. Charlie. Afternoon. I got a lot of quick responses for that one. What mm -hmm. is the cause of auroral activity? Meaning near the poles. Charlie. Charlie. Charlie, interaction in the E layer of charged particles from the sun with the Earth's magnetic field. Remember, that's where the particles will come in, in the north and south poles. Which of these emission modes is best for auroral propagation? Oh, 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 oh. Yep, so that's a good reason for you to learn CW, right? <laughs> Which of the following digital modes is designed for meteor scatter communications? Bravo. 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 MSK 144. Which of the following is a good technique for making meteor scatter techniques? <laughs> techniques. How about contacts? Charlie. Delta. Well, Charlie's correct. Charlie Bravo is too. correct. Alpha is correct. So that makes it uh, Delta. 
Wow. Yeah, so be careful not to get caught on that because you'll see one and say, ah, that's it. Well, read them all. When a meteor strikes the Earth's atmosphere, a cylindrical region of free electrons is formed at what layer of the ionosphere? Alpha. Alpha. It's the E layer, correct? Which of the following frequency ranges is most suited for meteor scatter communications? Charlie. Charlie. Yeah, I think six meters. That's kind of right in the middle there. That, that's where most, most people do it, six meters. Which of the following digital modes is especially useful for EME communications? Delta. Delta. It's our JT65. Oh, yes. Yeah, don't get EME and meteor scatter confused. Which, what is one advantage of, you, of the JT65 mode? Problem. Yeah, very low signal to noise ratio signals can be decoded. Which of the following describes a method for establishing EME contacts? Alpha. Alpha. Correct. Time synchronous transmissions alternately from each station, one minute each way. What is the approximate maximum separation measured along the surface of the Earth between two stations communicating by EME? The maximum distance. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah, halfway around. Remember, the Earth is about 25,000 miles all the way around 12,000 miles halfway. What characterizes libration fading of an EME signal? Uh, fluttery or irregular fading. When scheduling EME contacts, which of these, um, which of these conditions will generally result in the least path loss? Alpha. 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 Yeah, perigee, my, my silly periscope uh, mental trick. Okay, um, that wraps up the chapter. I've got just a, a few minutes to spend on some, some bonus things here. Now we talked about the antipode. Uh, th this is a kind of a cute diagram at uh, antipodesmap.com. And here we've got somebody sticking their head in the earth in uh, this looks like South Carolina and where if you had a really long neck where would it come up on the opposite side of the earth that's the concept of an antipode and it's like it's off the coast of Australia and notice that the software developer had a sense of humor it said antipodes location oops water do you know how to swim <laughs> so but this is useful because you can, when I, when I see a station in Australia or, or New Zealand, um, I, I get really excited because there's no further point on the earth that I, I can talk to. So that's the, the concept of an antipode. Which country is the furthest away from you? The ionosound I just mentioned briefly, this, this is the upward filing, firing radar that uh, allows the ionosphere to be uh, measured. I won't go through all of the details there, but this, this is what it looks like. The up, upward fire, uh, firing radar uh, gets a reflection from uh, 100 kilometers. That's, that would be the E layer. The F uh, layer is a little bit higher. And we, we've got the two, remember we said that the signals will, will split um, when it, they enter the ionosphere, well, it, that's, that's shown here. And this is an electron density chart. Notice that there's kind of an echo up here. What, what that's caused by is the up, upward firing radar will go up and, and, and hit the ionosphere, come down to Earth, bounce back up again. And here we've got a ghost trace that's double the distance from the top of the, of the F layer. So th this is one way that uh, scientists have been able to measure the ionosphere. Uh, this is the book that I mentioned earlier, only available as, as used currently. Here's some more, uh, here, here's another book that talks about propagation uh, related, related to uh, receiving antennas, especially for the, the new bands. And uh, that's the end of the bonus. So that'll wrap us up for tonight. I hope you found some things that were interesting and will be practical for you in your ham radio um, efforts. And uh, what have we got for next week, Gary? So next week we have the last chapter in the book. Uh, 
it's the last chapter in all of the books, but maybe it should be the first one. It's dealing with safety. Uh, and uh, I'm going to try to convince you that ham radio is an adventure. Uh, and we'll also talk about some updates to RF emission um, regulations that we have uh, and uh, what we need to know about to protect uh, human life uh, around our ham radio stations. That'll be in the first half uh, of the sh um, class next week. We'll take our break and then we'll take a practice test together as a group. Uh, you'll grade your own paper. We won't know your, what your result is, but uh, as a group we'll, we'll go ahead and do a 50 question uh, multiple choice test, an actual test, and see how we're doing. And uh, so that's the plan for next week. Very good. And I'd encourage everybody to start taking practice exams, as many as you can stand, and write down what you get wrong so that you can you can figure that out and uh, start improving your, your scores. When you get into the 80s and 90s, you're, you're pretty much ready to test. Okay, that's it for tonight then. Thank you all for your kind attention and your very thoughtful questions. And we'll see you again next week. We got out a minute early. We did. <laughs> 73. Yep. Thank you. Betcha.